in geology at, at Multnomah University in, in Portland. And he is actually also a former president of Design Science Association in Portland. They, they have a group like us that started in, in um, 1990, I believe, about th 30 years ago. And uh, so um, Keith has been associated with that group and has actually been president for 20 years or so. So he also leads creation tours, just like Ron Payne does. He has a degree in zoology and um, a, a, a medical degree from um, Washington University. Uh, this evening, he's going to speak on uh, what's been happening at Mount St. Helens. Uh, the uh, eruption occurred uh, um, 41 years ago now, on uh, uh, May the uh, 18th. And uh, it was devastated, and it covered 23 acres of devastation. And uh, people said that will never come back and grow, you know, trees and, and grass or whatever. Uh, so they expected a very long recovery. But as you'll see in Keith's talk, that really didn't take quite as long, and he'll explain why. So, Keith, come on up. Well, thank you, Heinz. I want to introduce Connie, my wife, who's out here. Say hello, Connie. I believe I was scheduled to give this talk a year ago. What happened? <laughs> a year went by, and here I am. So it's the 41st anniversary of the eruption of Mount St. Helens coming up. Well, our program today is titled Discovering the Hidden World of Mount St. Helens. And we're not working here. Oh, there we go. There we go. Now, those of you with a chemistry background might recognize this man. His name is Dmitry Mendeleev, and he's a Russian, or was a Russian chemistry professor who developed this. The periodic table of the elements. That's an iconic chart, as you know, that hangs on the walls of all chemistry laboratories. And as with many of the founders of modern science, Mendeleev firmly believed that the Bible was true. He firmly believed in it. And his favorite verse was this one. Proverbs 25, 2, which reads, It is the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of kings to search things out. And Mendeleev saw chemistry as a royal and a godly pursuit, and he successfully discovered and con the, the concealed or the hidden order that was inherent in the chemical elements placed there by God, the creator. So the title of today's program is a little bit similar. It suggests maybe a similar enterprise at Mount St. Helens. The ecosystems at the mountain appear to have been designed with an inherent ability to recover from catastrophic disturbance. And today we will look at some hitherfore, uh, heretofore hidden or unknown mechanisms and organisms by which this recovery is occurring. Well, here's what Mount St. Helens looked like uh, before the eruption. Many of you saw it, I'm sure, and it was a beautiful 9,677-foot snow-clad mountain, volcanic cone, surrounded by an expansive coniferous forest. And you can see Spirit Lake in the foreground here, a very beautiful place. On May 18th, 1980, uh, it, Mount St. Helens experienced this cataclysmic eruption that I think we are all familiar with today. And the eruption consisted of um, And the eruption consisted of several volcanic events and processes, which are just listed here. I'm not going over this in detail. Uh, it's, a, it's a whole other talk. But initially, there was a big earthquake, and then a huge landslide, sometimes called a debris avalanche. And it was followed by a sideways blast, or a lateral blast, which, which over the landscape to the north. And then a vertical um, eruption uh, went on for nine hours and dropped ash on the whole area. There was also a giant wave, or waves, that came out of Spirit Lake, up onto the mountains uh, north of uh, Spirit Lake. 
And uh, there were mud flows that went down the rivers of this area. And finally, there were hot ash or pyroclastic flows, so-called, that buried the area north of the volcano. So there was a, a whole series of different events, and it produced what we know today as the blast zone, a portion of which you see here. And I think that's an amazing picture. Look at all those logs, how they were just mowed down and, and just lay there. Now, here's a map of the blast zone. And as you can see from the color coding, uh, it is not uniform, but rather it's a mosaic uh, that's formed by vari the various events and processes that I just mentioned. Well, four decades have now passed, and uh, that's since the big eruption, during which this uh, ecosystem has been progressively recovering. That is, it's been reassembling itself as seen here in an image from Lahar Overlook. Okay. Yeah. Trying to back it up. Uh, it went near, that. There we go. We're on track. So the volcano disrupted the Mount St. Helens ecosystem. Similar to pieces being separated uh, in a puzzle. This puzzle represents uh, uh, the organisms and the processes that make up the Mount St. Helens ecosystem, and they're all like pieces of the puzzle, and they're interconnected in various ways. Well, the volcano disrupted that, that puzzle, similar to these puzzle pieces being scattered and separated from each other and scattered randomly. But over the last 40 years, the ecosystem has been reassembling itself and continues to do so today, as represented by this partially completed puzzle. So in this program, uh, I would like to look at 10 examples of organisms, sometimes fairly mundane organisms, and also processes that are responsible for this rebuilding of the Mount St. Helens landscape. Because you have to ask the question, you know, how does it do this? How does the, the uh, Mount St. Helens ecosystem or the landscape recover as it is doing? And as we go through these uh, slides, I would like you to keep in mind three questions. Number one, is the Mount St. Helens ecosystem designed to recover from disturbance? Somewhat like your human, the human body, you know, is designed to recover from an injury. Number two, does recovery at Mount St. Helens help us understand global recovery following Noah's flood, a ca very catastrophic event? And thirdly, we can ask, do lessons learned at Mount St. Helens enable us to become better stewards of God's creation? Now, in ecology, the destruction of an ecosystem, such as what happened at Mount St. Helens, is called a disturbance. Defined here simply as any process that disrupts an ecosystem. That would include things like forest fires and wind and flooding and disease and volcanic eruptions and on and on. And remarkably, it appears that a disturbance immediately initiates a suite of processes which we call succession, or you might simply say recovery. Succession, the term is the used to define the, or to uh, include the development of plant and animal communities following a disturbance. A human analogy might be a multi-car pileup on the freeway, a disturbance, which promptly initiates an emergency response led by first responders. So you might wonder who or what were the first responders at Mount St. Helens. Now, Fred Swanson is a geomorphologist, a geologist, and he worked on the landslide deposit north of Mount St. Helens just 10 days after the eruption, May 28, 1980. And he was digging little holes in the deposits up there, as geologists are inclined to do, and he noticed something that really puzzled him. And to quote uh, an account of the event, uh, he said there were these little spider-like threads in the holes, he said, nearly invisible. And at first, uh, Swanson um, did not know or did not understand what he was looking at, but he later learned, and he learned that these, fungal, these were fungal filaments, which are termed hyphae. 
And they were fungal filaments of the so-called phenicoid fungi. These are fungi that can, the spores can lay dormant in the soil for decades or longer. And the fungi only, uh, only uh, start to grow after some kind of a heat stimulus. Usually that's a forest fire, but in this case, it was a volcanic eruption. And that name phenicoid was coined at Mount St. Helens for these fungi because uh, of the so-called, the mythical phoenix bird that supposedly uh, was reborn repeatedly from the ashes. So it's interesting that in just 10 days, the fungi Swanson observed had formed a living web of near microscopic sized filaments spread throughout the volcanic ash uh, that covered the debris avalanche. Not saying over the whole area, but in this particular location. Now this is a photomicrograph um, magnified a thousand times of uh, fungal hyphae. And you can see the filaments there, and they're made of fungal cells which are attached end to end. The small round bodies are spores, reproductive spores of the fungus. So Swanson called his discovery the first biological response to the eruption, the fungi being the first responders. But you might ask the question, uh, what are these little filaments doing? Are they doing anything important? Well, to answer the question, let me just quote from a, uh, a scientific journal uh, called Forest Ecology and Management, and it says this, the mycelial or fungal mats appeared to play an important functional role on site, possibly aggregating soil particles in otherwise highly erodible landscapes. We hypothesize that fungi, such as anthrocobia, that's a group of fungi, are pivotal species in early system recovery after disturbance, helping to minimize the movement of soil in the absence of plant roots. Other functional roles of early uh, post-fire fungi might include nutrient acquisition leading to the reestablishment of, of vegetation. Well, in case you missed some of that, let me just uh, outline it here. And uh, so what he's saying here is that the fungi by growing through the ash, stabilize the deposits. They reduced erosion. In other words, the hyphae acted like tiny, you know, microscopic rebar going through these loose deposits. The hyphae or filaments also then sort of tied these little particles of ash together into bundles. And then between the bundles, there were pore spaces. And those pore spaces helped aeration, air to get into these deposits, as developing soil would need. And also, um, they improved the ability to, of water to infiltrate the deposits. In addition, the fungi decomposed organic material, like leaf fragments and wood fragments and so forth that was in the ash. And they decomposed them and released the, uh, the nutrients that was in this material. Because the volcanic ash contains almost no nutrients, uh, which of course would be required by, by plants. And then the fungi themselves incorporated those nutrients into them, their own bodies, into themselves. And eventually, they formed fungal mats on the surface of the, of the landscape. And then these fungal mats became colonized by photosynthetic organisms, things like algae and mosses and later vascular plants, all of which used the nutrients of the fungi. So this whole scenario uh, suggests the ecosystem at Mount St. Helens is programmed to rapidly rebound from major disturbance, like maybe somebody thought it through ahead of time. And you might say, what was Fred Swanson's reaction to his discovery. Well, he stated, it was an afternoon that ranks right up there with the birth of my children. It was just so amazing and interesting. I've spoken like a true scientist, but I do wonder what his wife thought of that statement. <laughs> so that's the first responders. Let's move on to another topic. Following the eruption, many scientists predicted that the return of insects to the blast zone would be extremely slow. Note this quote from botanist A.B. Adams. He said, there seems to be, seemed to be justification to believe that it would be impossible for insects to recover at all. Bugs of all things, why wouldn't they return? Well, maybe Adams' uh, quote was a little bit of an overstatement, but he had good reason for what he said. Uh, and uh, the good reason is that uh, Fresh, dry, volcanic ash is a natural insecticide. 
Uh, first of all, you might ask, what uh, is volcanic ash? It's not something that is burned or has been burned. Uh, rather, it's defined as just the fine fragments of volcanic uh, rock, which have been blasted into the atmosphere and then eventually settled uh, on the ground. Now, Mount St. Helens erupted for nine hours on May 18th, 1980. You remember, remember images like this, I'm sure. Uh, and it sent ash to 70,000 70, feet into the, uh, into the atmosphere. And some of that ash was uh, carried by upper level winds uh, actually around the Earth. Some of it actually returned to Mount St. Helens again. Uh, the, in, the ash, in the blast zone, however, all, the falling ash left just a thick deposit on everything, including all the exposed bugs. Now, what effect does ash have on insects? or arthropods, as I say here. And by arthropods, I mean insects, uh, spiders, uh, millipedes, other similar things. Well, what it does is it abrades the waxy cuticle that covers their exoskeletons. You know, bugs have a hard skeleton that's on the outside, not like our internal skeleton. And covering that skeleton is a waxy layer that, that holds the water in. And so that got abraded away, and insects desiccated, and they died from that. It also clogged their digestive tracts. It also clogged their respiratory pores or spiracles. And then they always tried to clean uh, their uh, uh, selves up from the ash, and so they lost a lot of water just in the salivation. So they died basically of clogging everything up and, and, and desiccating and dying. Here's an example. This is a uh, yellow-spotted millipede. If you hike our forest, you've probably seen these. And it actually has another name besides yellow-spotted millipede that I actually like better, and that's the night train millipede, because you can see this as a, as a black millipede, like a train going through the night, and all that you see are the yellow lights where the windows are. So I kind of like that night train millipede name. Well, here's a quote from researchers Edwards and Sugg. Um, who say, talked about this millipede, and they said one dramatic die-off among the pedestrian taxa was noted in the vicinity of Ryan Lake, which was, uh, at Mount, which was at Mount St. Helens in September of 1980, when innumerable dead millipedes, uh, Harpathia Harp is their scientific name, were found in the blowdown zone. These millipedes are important litter consumers, and they died with their guts packed with ash, uh, and as they attempted to feed on ash-covered litter. Well, after the eruption, concerns arose that large outbreaks of Douglas fir and silver fir bark beetles would occur in all these dead trees, and then they would move on and threaten the living forests. And the issue was used by the United States Forest Service and the timber industry as an argument for rapidly salvage logging uh, the blast zone. Forest ecologists, on the other hand, strongly disagreed. There was quite a discussion on this. Indicate, they indicated that salvage logging was not necessary and that it would also be harmful to recovery. So here's a um, distinctive pattern of one of these bark beetles. This is called a gallery. It's un, in the inner bark, or the outer bark has been removed. You can see the, 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 the passageways in which the eggs are laid and the larvae develop and so forth. So that's a pattern made by bark beetles. Well, what um, actually happened? Here's a summary. In retrospect, it appeared that no management ne action was necessary to avert insect outbreaks because the Mount St. Helens ash was a potent natural insecticide that caused rapid insect mortality. Thus, Mount St. Helens ecosystem had a built-in mechanism which prevented runaway insect infestations. Next, let's look at the first colonizers of the pumice plain. So what exactly is the pumice plain? Well, here is a photograph taken before the eruption, looking north from Mount St. Helens, and the X marks the site of the future pumice plain. And before the eruption, this pumice plain was a beautiful old growth uh, forest, a very uh, spectacular forest. You can see Spirit Lake there. It looks like two lakes, but uh, they're, they're connected, so that's all Spirit Lake. And you can see Mount Rainier in the distance. 
Now listed here are the impacts that that site that became the pumice plain uh, suffered. That area was buried by hundreds of feet of debris avalanche or landslide deposits. It was blasted by that sideways eruption. And it was sterilized by 1,700 degree Fahrenheit pyroclastic or hot ash flows that landed down in that area. And then it was covered by nine hours of ash fall. So uh, when we look at it, there is the result. I can back it up in case you missed it. So we went from that before the eruption to that. See the difference? Pretty striking. Uh, so this pumice plain site now had been a haven of life, but it was converted to a sterile wasteland in which no organisms survived, not even microbes. It was simply too hot for anything to have survived. So, of course, in many other areas of Mount St. Helens blast zone, lots of life survived. But in this particular spot, that didn't happen. The surface of the pumice plain looks like this. It's called desert pavement. Uh, this volcanic material contains no carbon, nitrogen, or available phosphorus. In other words, mo most all of the nutrients needed by plants simply aren't there. Not a very inviting sight. But recovery here will occur. And recovery here reco re occurs by means of a process called primary succession. Now, what is that? There's some ecological terms we're talking about. Primary succession is the colonization by organisms of a surface that has never supported life previously. Think of the Ho uh, Hawaiian lava flows, or currently the ones in Iceland. The, the uh, orange uh, lava flows out and then it cools and turns black and forms this uh, rock we call basalt. And the surface of those lava flows never, has never supported life before, but yet over time, sufficient time, it's going to be able to support life. Soil will develop, plants will colonize, and so forth. That's primary succession, and that's what happened on the pumice plain. Uh, I'll uh, back up just a second, yeah. Uh, just to contrast that, the secondary succession in ecology is when a certain area is disturbed, but there's life that remains, which is called biological legacies. For example, you have a forest fire that burns an area. That is all life extinguished? No. There are many trees that survive, many plants that survive, things in the soil survive, all kinds of living things and organic material survives. And so that is secondary succession. So in that situation, recovery doesn't start from zero. It starts with a lot of material already there. Primary succession, though, is more difficult. It starts from zero. So here's a um, question for you. Um, what organisms do you think first successfully colonized this sterile pumice plain? Uh, you can vote on this. Raise your hands. Who votes for phenacoid fungi? Yeah, good choice. I just talked about them. How about mosses and lichens? They kind of come in early, don't they? Yeah, yeah, that's a good thought. How about weeds? Any in favor of weeds? Yeah, they, they go anywhere. Um, pocket gophers, maybe. Yeah, OK. How about predatory beetles? No, I didn't think anybody would want that one. Well, you want to know what the answer is? Predatory beetles. Fooled you. Um, an important concept uh, at uh, Mount St. Helens is arthropod fallout. You might call it bug fall if you prefer. But especially during summer months, everywhere, not just Mount St. Helens, but it's in the summer when arthropods are most active, many are carried by the winds and they travel great distances. Eventually they fall to the ground, either alive or dead, and this constitutes the arthropod fallout. Most of the live fallout on the pumice plain died. It was just too harsh. A few species lived, but failed to reproduce. They didn't really colonize it. However, one group not only lived, but successfully reproduced. And this is the group. Predatory beetles of the family known as carabidae or ground beetles, 
and particularly this one, which has a name that I'm sure you're familiar with, Bambidium planatum. <laughs> Never heard of that? I hadn't either. But that's the scientific name. I don't think it has a common name. But this is a particular beetle that specializes, is designed to specialize on very inhospitable, disturbed habitat. So at Mount St. Helens, it felt right at home. And it became the first successful colonizer of that area. Um, however, you might ask, in such a sterile environment, on what did it feed? How could it possibly survive? And the answer is very simple. Bambidian consumed exclusively its fellow arthropod fallout companions, both the living and the dead. So here's uh, an important uh, concept, or term, and that's an Aeolian zone. In ecology, that's a habitat in which resident organisms, like that beetle, depend solely on inputs of nutrients transported by the wind. And researchers Edwards and Sugg concerning this said, this pattern that we just described is a widespread and perhaps a general one for terrestrial primary successional habitats. We propose that comparable pioneer predatory and scavenging arthropods operate around the entire Pacific Ring of Fire, around the entire Pacific Ocean, and where in other volcanic uh, areas, wherever volcanic activity produces new surfaces, that is primary succession. Should not, statements like this, um, from secular scientists cause us to wonder whether perhaps Aeolian communities then pioneered new volcanic surfaces following the global disturbance of Noah's flood. We try to figure out a little bit about how Noah's flood, how the Earth could recover after that. Well, here's maybe a clue that uh, this type of thing was operative for a period of time. Likely that is the case. Um, well, as we have just uh, learned, these barren volcanic deposits lacked the nutrients required by plants, like we see here. This is the pumice plain again, particularly nitrogen. And so what was needed were fertilizer factories, such as this plant. If you are a plant person, you probably recognize that as a lupin. It's prairie lupin. And lupins are legumes. They are members of the pea family of plants, and they're able to fix nitrogen. Not that it's broken, that's not what it means. But uh, our atmosphere has 70% nitrogen. We have a lot of nitrogen, but plants are not able to use nitrogen from the air in its gaseous forms. What they need is nitrogen compounds, things like ammonia. And uh, here's another uh, much larger light, uh, lupin species at Mount St. Helens. It's called broadleaf lupin. It also fixes nitrogen. And lupins accomplish nitrogen fixation by having little root nodules, little, little nodules on their roots which contain or serve as homes for certain bacteria. Uh, the one here is called rhizobium, if you're interested. And these bacteria are able to take atmospheric nitrogen and turn it into chemical compounds that plants can use. Plants themselves cannot fix nitrogen, but they provide homes for bacteria that are able to accomplish that task. Uh, so you might say, why uh, do plants need nitrogen in the first place? Well, Proteins, all living organisms are made of lots of proteins, and proteins are made of amino acids, and amino acids contain nitrogen. So that's important right there. Also, nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, contain nitrogen. So it's pretty important stuff. All life requires nitrogen compounds. Now, besides lupins, the other major nitrogen-fixing plants at Mount St. Helens are the alder trees, or shrubs. And there's two species there. There's the red alder that lives in the lower elevations, and then the, at higher elevation is the Sitka alder. And both are fast-growing, pioneering trees, and they quickly take over vast areas. Uh, this is a mountain near Spirit Lake, and if you hike the Harmony Trail, as some of you may have done, uh, you go right by this mountain, and it is totally covered by Sitka alder. You can see the conifers are recovering on the flat surface below, but the mountain is covered by alder. Uh, dense. Um, Stands of alder, this is red alder, 
cover lower elevation areas. Many square miles are covered with dense uh, forest like that. Now the alder root nodules are seen here, and they're fairly good size. Uh, they house the nitrogen-fixing bacteria. This is alder, so it has a different one called Frankia, a different species than the lupin, but it's the same idea. And finally, this slide shows the development of soil. The rock is weathering and, and is forming the mineral components of soil, and the alder leaves are decomposing, adding carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus and other things uh, to, the, uh, to the, uh, the substrate that is developing, which will be a soil that can support forest plants, including the conifer trees. Well, let's um, move from there and look at fungal extenders for plant roots. Um, this is a particularly important issue, I think, and as we know, plants have roots as seen on the left, but most also have extenders that reach far beyond the plant roots, and these are seen on the right, and they, consend, they consist of fungal hyphae, and oh, there's that word again, and uh, they are attached to the root tips. So such fungi are called mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, from the Greek, um, myco means fungus, rhiza is root, you put it together, mycorrhizal or fungus root fungi. Now here is a scanning electron micrograph showing two root tips, the, big, the bigger structures in there, and you can see all the fine hyphae or filaments from these mycorrhizal fungi attaching to the root tips. And this is a stained cross-section of a root tip, and the uh, hyphae are actually have penetrated into the cells, and all the little purple bodies inside the cells, like where the arrow is pointing, are these fungal, fungal hyphae. Many of the mushrooms you see when you walk around the forest in the fall is particularly, I mean, the mushrooms you see are the fruiting bodies or spore-producing structures um, for uh, these mycorrhizal fungal networks in the forest soil. This one's called Amethyst lacaria, and uh, this is a rushula, common forest mushroom. Here's another one of that species pushing its way through the forest floor. This is a coral fungus. And uh, this one forms these mycorrhizal connections also. So you might say then, how does this plant fungus or mycorrhizal relationship work? What does it accomplish? Well, first of all, the fungus itself um, penetrates and explores the forest soil for up to tens of meters from the plant. And then it transports water and nutrients back to the host plant. And those nutrients include things like nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium and other things. And then in return, the plant supplies the fungus with sugars, uh, which it has, pr has produced through photosynthesis. And of course, this is very helpful because fungi cannot photosynthesize. And so this relationship is both a symbiosis and a mutualism. It's a symbiosis in that it's, it's uh, two species living in close association. And it's a mutualism in that both species benefit. It's a win-win situation. So how common are these mycorrhizal associations out in nature? Uh, it's been learned in recent years that the vast majority of plants on Earth are partnered with soil fungi. That is, there are thousands of species of fungi associated with nearly 300,000 species of plants. And that includes most of the plants in our Northwest forests, and certainly, I think, all of the the conifer and hardwood trees. So this um, importance of these fungi in northwest forests can hardly be overemphasized. Simply put, without the fungal connection, we would not have our forests, or at least forests as we have, they would be greatly diminished. Uh, therefore, at Mount St. Helens, it would seem that it would be very important for these mycorrhizal connections to be reestablished as quickly as possible. Um, there were some problems, however. Uh, after the eruption, the surviving fungi and spores were buried in the old soil, which was at the bottom, as shown in this diagram, and then that was covered by inches to feet of volcanic debris and deposits. 
And then the seeds coming in from, by blowing in the wind and by animals and so forth, seeds and spores and things like that, ended up on the top, uh, well separated from the mycorrhizal uh, fungi. You would think what would be needed here would be some kind of an excavator to bring the soil out and, and put it on the top there. And you can guess maybe what this who this excavator was. And here he is. The northern pocket gopher brought the soil up and out, and that soil contained seeds and spores and mycorrhizal fungi and all kinds of nutrients. And so pocket gopher mounds became um, little oases of plant recovery in the blast zone. Uh, and the pocket gopher himself became quite a hero and was uh, given a lot of credit in the media. There was a lot of stories about the, the northern pocket gopher. You think of gophers as being not very helpful in your garden, but in the system out there at Mount St. Helens, it was, it was a hero. Well, let's look at something else. Um, and we'll look at grazers of the canopy. Uh, you'll love this one. What I'm referring to here is this, the western tent caterpillar. I'm sure you're all fond of those, have seen them around. And the reason for these caterpillars, or for their name, is that they build these tent-like structures, uh, which uh, they use for thermal regulation and for protection from predators, especially from birds. And the caterpillars spread out from their tent homes to forage on leaves. And at Mount St. Helens, that means red or Sitka alder. That's their favorite food. And then when mature, they uh, form cocoons like this, which metamorphose into moths. And here's the female moth, and she's just laid a big egg mass around a, a stem of a plant there. And then these eggs will, over, or will uh, overwinter, so, and the next spring they will hatch out as little uh, larvae, and the life cycle continues on and on. So tent caterpillars, exhibit boom and bust population dynamics. Uh, they are usually present in small to moderate numbers. You'll see them fairly often. But every several years, their populations explode, resulting in near complete defoliation of many square miles of trees. You can see in this photo at Mount St. Helens, the foliage of the alders is mostly gone. And you can see the tent structures re quite readily. Uh, 2012 was a uh, 2012 was a boom year for tent caterpillars at Mount St. Helens. I recall being up there with a couple of friends, and and uh, wherever we looked were these black and orange caterpillars. And one reporter described it this way: "They're everywhere up here, and they brought the elements of an insect horror movie to uh, the Toodle Valley." The hummocks trail near Coldwater Lake is speckled with their brown, fuzzy bodies, and you can't help squashing them by the dozens as you hike the terrain northwest of Mount St. Helens. Um, they, they've turned the trunks of trees into wiggling, squirming masses. If you briefly stand still, several will creep up your boots and legs. Interpretive signs and kiosks are curtained with their writhing bodies, and if you stand silent, you can hear them munching away at the leaves of the red alder trees. Here's another quote from uh, Caitlin Labar, who, who's a member of Design Science Association, and she's quite an authority on butterflies and writes books and so forth on it. But she described it this way. I noticed caterpillars covering the road in bushes and then realized many of the alder trees along the forest road were nearly defoliated. When I stood quietly and listened, it sounded like it was raining even though there were no clouds in the sky. It was the sound of all the droppings of millions of caterpillars falling through the trees and bushes. Gross, but fascinating. That was her take on it. Well, all of this, then, should make you wonder if someone shouldn't have done something about the caterpillar explosion, like maybe bug bomb the blast zone. But was that really necessary, or would it have been wise? Uh, after all, this is a native species we're talking about here, not an invader. And possibly, could the caterpillar hordes actually be doing things that would be beneficial to the forest ecosystem and further the recovery process? Possible, maybe. Listed here are some potentially positive effects of tent caterpillars at Mount St. Helens. You probably never heard of a positive effect of a tent caterpillar before, but here's some. First, the uh, Tent caterpillars control alder populations, 
we can see that would be obvious. Uh, what do you call a plant species that lacks controls? Uh, nothing eats it. It has no parasites or disease organisms. It just can grow as it pleases. What do you call that? Well, you call that an invasive species. And the fact that tent caterpillars help control alder growth and spread is a good thing. Everything out there needs to have, it, have checks and balances, controls, and so forth, or you have invasive type of organisms. Um, so the fact that the tent caterpillar does this, that's a good thing. The droppings and carcasses from masses of tent caterpillars fall. They enrich the soil. Think of them as little packages of nutrient-rich, nitrogen-rich fertilizer. And then the alder also um, defoliates the tree, or the alder is defoliated by the tent caterpillars. And what does that do? Well, that lets the light in through the tops of the trees. The canopy is opened up. It's not shading the forest floor. And so you combine that nutrient pulse from the caterpillars and the increased light coming through, and you get a spurt of growth of the forest floor, floor plants, including the, these conifer seedlings that are getting going in that location. And ecologists um, at Mount St. Helens believe that repeated episodes of defoliation of alder likely accelerate the conversion of alder forests to conifer forests. And that's a positive thing. Uh, this concept has not been fully or rigorously documented, but here's one article that was fairly rigorous from Canada, and it says multiple years of defoliation likely caused more rapid canopy transition from aspen to fir. Something similar may be going on at Mount St. Helens. Lastly, uh, caterpillars provide an abundant food source for birds uh, during the day, and uh, at night, the bats feed on the moths. So in doing so, the birds and the bats are both widely dispersing uh, nutrients from the caterpillars and the moths and furthering the development of soil. Now, this is Dr. John Bishop. Dr. Bishop is a uh, biology professor at Washington State University in Vancouver and a researcher at Mount St. Helens. I had the pleasure of spending a day in the field with him a few years ago. And Dr. Bishop's research uh, focuses on the interactions between insects and plants. In addition to studying the tent caterpillar, he's shown that various other plant populations listed here uh, initially grow in an uncontrolled fashion until a specific insect establishes and regulates and controls the growth of that species of plants. I think the first thing he studied was the willow. And the willow comes up around all the wet, wet areas at Mount St. Helens, and it grew uh, to an astounding uh, degree until some stem boring weevils or beetles entered that weakened the stems and they broke off. It sort of, the, in other words, the beetles sort of pruned these. And uh, that was probably in the long run a helpful thing. Well, let's go to the next uh, topic, which is snorkelers in Spirit Lake. Now, Here we see the pumice plain in Spirit Lake again. Same photograph I showed you before. Recall that all life was destroyed on the pumice plain. There, was no, there were no biological legacies. Also remember that initially these pumice deposits lacked the nutrients needed by plants. And finally notice that Spirit Lake and the pumice plain are right together. The pumice plain forms the south shore of Spirit Lake. They are side by side. Here's a quote from Edwards and Sugg, saying simply, the total organic and nitrogen content of 1980 samples of these pumice plain deposits was reported as zero. It, there's just no, no nutrients were there. In contrast, however, following the eruption, Spirit Lake was loaded with nutrients. Why? Because the charred remains of a large old growth forest had been washed by giant waves into the lake and it was now decomposing. And the nutrient uh, concentrations in the lake skyrocketed. Uh, phosphorus uh, jumped 80 times its pre-eruption levels, and uh, nitrogen 50 times its pre-eruption levels. Uh, with all those nutrients, you'd think something would be taking advantage of those nutrients and using them. 
And uh, this quote says as follows, the soup, meaning the waters of Spirit Lake, which was a soup at that time, provided the substrate for massive bacterial blooms during the first two years after the eruption. In Spirit Lake, those blooms reached the extraordinary figure of nearly a half billion, with a B, cells, that is bacterial cells, per milliliter. And that's probably a record in the annals of environmental microbiology, I understand. Um, this um, diagram then depicts the situation. We have nutrient-rich Spirit Lake uh, on, on the left side there. And uh, right next to that, we have uh, the pumice plain, which is nutrient poor. It would seem that a nutrient transferring organism would be very useful here. However, there was a big, big problem. Those bacteria quickly had used up all the oxygen in the lake's water. Uh, so the only organisms that could live in the water were, were organisms that didn't require oxygen, and that would be like anaerobic or non-oxygen requiring bacteria. Nothing else could particularly live there, except for one. There's the bacteria. And, then, and there it is, the mosquito. Another hero. <laughs> uh, the, so this is, is the adult mosquito, and here is a larvae. And you can see I labeled its tail uh, end there, uh, the thing that protrudes as a siphon or a snorkel. So in contrast to most aquatic creatures that breathe their oxygen through the water, this one does not. Mosquito larvae surface, and put their, their snorkel up above the water level and take in atmospheric oxygen. So it was able to thrive in Spirit Lake, uh, feasting on the, the bacteria and able to find oxygen just fine. And here we see a whole bunch of mosquito larvae doing the same thing. Perhaps you've noticed they tend to congregate at the surface like that if they're in your pond or whatever. So once mosquito larvae in Spirit Lake metamorphosed into adults, they dispersed all, dispersed all over the place, including to that pumice plain. And eventually they died, and they kept doing this and that over and over again. And so their nutrient-rich carcasses then released Spirit Lake nutrients into the sterile volcanic deposits. And uh, Edwards and Sugg said uh, this was a uh, striking example of nutrient redistribution at a landscape level. Uh, that's not, it's probably not a huge amount of nutrients, but what, you're, what I'm trying to do here is show you the components of recovery, and a lot of these things are small things when all added together end up with the recovery that we're seeing at, at the National Monument. Thus, it appears that mosquitoes, like tent caterpillars, ground beetles, weevils, grasshoppers, soil fungi, pocket gophers, all these creatures, uh, were very valuable components in the recovery process. Heroes, if you like. Well, let's move on. Um, next one, I just mentioned uh, switch hitting salamanders. Now, most salamanders in the blast zone died during the eruption, uh, but there were also survivors, many of which were still hibernating in the muddy bottoms of ice covered ponds and lakes. This is a northwestern salamander which uh, survived. But uh, survivors faced a daunting challenge. Part of their habitat. The surrounding forest was now an inhospitable pumice wasteland. How could amphibious creatures that live part of their life cycle in the water and then part on land, how could they uh, survive uh, when the, with the land component uh, become, had become inhospitable? Um, and the solution for the salamanders was neoteny. Maybe you've heard of it, probably not. Uh, another term is pedomorphism. Probably not heard of that one either, but what is it? It's the permanent retention of larval aquatic features, like gills and fins, into adulthood. So think of it this way. Uh, the salamander larvae in the water normally will go through metamorphosis and come out a terrestrial, a, a land creature that walks away from the water. But that didn't happen here in many instances. Uh, the salamanders went through metamorphosis and became reproductively mature organisms, but they retained their gills and fins and aquatic features. So they were obligated to stay in the water even though they were now adults. And so um, the, this sort of behavior was noticed in three of the species of salamanders, and perhaps there's others up there in which it happened as well. Here we see a uh, neotene. You can see the gill sticking out of the base of the neck there. Now, an author named Spruels 
uh, hypothesized that neoteny may be an adaptation enabling certain salamanders to survive severe terrestrial disturbances. Um, and uh, Charlie Crisofulli, one of the most productive researchers at Mount St. Helens, um, uh, wrote this. He said, neoteny was an important life history characteristic for three salamander species that appeared to allow these species to persist or flourish in the post-eruption landscape. As the forest returns to Mount St. Helens, the importance of neoteny should diminish and metamorphism uh, may become more adaptive uh, trait. So early in recovery then, neoteny was a life-saving strategy for certain amphibians. But as the blast zone recovered, salamanders and frogs became amphibian travelers. Um, lengthy dispersals over harsh volcanic terrain would seem really a daunting task for frogs and toads and salamanders. And here's the reasons. They have a fairly delicate integument. They're not covered by fur or feathers or scales. They need it rather cool and moist. They um, have specific food requirements. They travel rather slowly. Um, but it turns out that many amphibians made rather remarkable dispersal journeys at Mount St. Helens. For example, this fellow. This is a western toad. And here you see the entire critter well camouflaged on the forest floor. And dispersal distances for the western toad were one mile, 2.7 miles, and 3.4 miles. Now, um, these numbers are based on a straight line of travel, you know, as the crow flies, not as the toad hops. And uh, toads travel a much more regular pathway around obstacles, and so their actual distances were probably much more than what we are, are seeing here. Uh, this is a red leg frog on the debris avalanche uh, in a pond. And uh, perhaps you're wondering about the name. Its legs don't look red. Well, there's another one that uh, I caught in a, up on the Clackamas River uh, in the Mount Hood National Forest. And yes, it does have red legs. You can see them there. But uh, here's the dispersal distance for the red leg frog. Uh, one was uh, noted to go 2.2 miles from its source to its uh, destination. Here's again our northwestern salamander. And northwestern salamanders made uh, some noteworthy journeys of 1.1 and 1.8 miles. They dispersed from Spirit Lake in, out into the pumice plain where some ponds had developed. But here's the champion of all. And this is a, an amphibian uh, known as the Pacific tree frog. You've probably seen them around, these little green or brown uh, cute little frogs. It's perched on a volcanic rock there. And uh, there we see a closer look at the Pacific tree frog. And uh, it dispersed all over the place, of course. But here's one place where it did end up, in the crater. Uh, and having made that dispersal myself, I can tell you it's not an easy journey to get in there. Uh, but uh, what was the dispersal distance? Six miles. Well, probably it was maybe even double that because of the you know, irregular path the critter would have had to take. And so remarkable dispersal capability among these creatures. Um, so how are they able to do this? Uh, there's four factors, I think, that enter in here. One is called species vigility. It's just that uh, the innate capability of the creature to, to do this. Uh, some, uh, are like woodland salamanders, they just are sedentary. They just stay put. They don't move. So they don't disperse well. But the northwestern salamander and others are good dispersers. They're, they're innately able to, to move. And they have high vigility. Uh, high reproductive capacity is important. Um, you know, if, if you're going to have a lot of creatures dying, you might as well make a lot of them so that some of them will make it through. But uh, one uh, western toad female in a season will produce 17,000 eggs. And of course, those eggs uh, result in tadpoles. They just blacken the shores of some of the ponds up there. And the tadpoles metamorphose into toadlets, which again then disperse. Many uh, die and simply transfer their nutrients, which is beneficial, but some of them reach a destination and are successful. Uh, landscape permeability is a big uh, factor. What does that mean? Well, there's only two times a year when these dispersals happen, and that's when the landscape is wet. 
uh, and that would be with the fall rains and with the spring snow melt and the spring rains. That when it is in the dead of winter or the heat of summer, these dispersals do not occur. And lastly, some of these creatures take the subway. Um, they um, they uh, partner with this character again, the northern pocket gopher. The pocket gopher has developed or built networks of tunnels all over the place. And so the amphibians will go in these tunnels, which are humid and cooler, and actually they travel through them, or at least they go in there to, to rest. And I recall looking down a little burrow like this one time and seeing a western toad looking right back at me. So they certainly, certainly are in there. Well, our last topic. What's wrong with this picture? Uh, this is Mita Lake in the blast zone. If you've visited Mount St. Helens on the east side, you've probably been here. But uh, uh, notice the interpretive sign and the viewing platform. Why were they built in the water, of all things? Uh, you maybe have guessed the answer. Uh, there's a certain animal uh, related that, that did this and is responsible. Uh, it's a nocturnal animal, so it's very hard to get a photograph. So the best I could do is this. There he is, the beaver. And uh, the heading for our section here is Corps of Engineers. What do, what do beaver do? Well, in contrast to the animal itself, you see a lot of the cuttings as evidence that they're there. And here's a da little dam on Harmony Creek by Spirit Lake. Um, beaver, by damming creeks, have produced many wetlands, new wetlands, in the debris avalanche and elsewhere. And these wetlands provide habitat for a host of organisms that otherwise would be less common or simply absent. Things like great blue herons and wood ducks and muskrats and red-legged frogs and garter snakes and dragonflies and cattails and sedges and on and on. We could go probably hundreds of species. And for this reason, beaver are considered a keystone species in an ecosystem. Uh, a keystone is defined as a species upon which other species in an ecosystem largely depend, such that if the keystone were removed, the ecosystem would change drastically. And so this beaver that creates wetlands in an area that would not have wetlands otherwise uh, is, um, is, is greatly increasing the number of organisms that can live in there. Now, after the eruption, we had lots of these ponds, and that's a hummock. That's part of the top of Mount St. Helens sitting there. And then a lot of ponds in the low areas of this avalanche deposit. And typically, around the edges would grow the willow trees. And they would uh, uh, be very prolific in their growth. And then amphibians, such as the salamander I talked about, they require these woody plant stems uh, like the willow, to anchor their egg masses to. And these sites are called ovipositioning sites, usually consisting of woody twigs uh, uh, or sticks. And these sticks are partially or fully submerged in water. The problem was that the willows grew beside the water, not in the water. So they were useless to the uh, amphibians as far as reproductive sites. But um, Enter the beaver, and the beaver dams the outlet streams, waste, raises the water level, and of course floods the willow, producing tremendous habitat for reproduction of the amphibians. And uh, here is a northwestern salamander egg mass. You notice the stick, and here's another one. You can see the stick well there too. Um, Charlie Crisofoli again. He said before beaver activity, ovipositioning substrates were sparse and likely limited salamander reproduction. Beavers had their most pronounced effect in the debris avalanche zone. They created dams that caused water levels to inundate uh, the, the uh, surrounding land, and the plant stems that were in the water now were used by the salamanders and so forth. So a, a very valuable thing. Now, skip, skip that one. Yeah. Uh, so that concludes 10 examples of processes, organisms, interactions that have been observed and studied in Mount St. Helens. You can think of each as like a piece of a, the jigsaw puzzle I showed you. And of course, there are literally thousands more examples 
some of which are known, most of which probably are not known. And together, all of these things, if you put them all together, they are the reason the destroyed ecosystem is recovering. They are the reason why it recovers. And so what are some takeaway lessons from this? Let's just go back to the three um, questions. Um, uh, first of all, it says, does the Mount St. Helens ecosystem show evidence that it was designed to recover from severe disturbance? And the question reminds me of a statement by an engineer, which goes something like this. If something works, it didn't happen by accident. Uh, doesn't the mere fact that a complex ecosystem is highly functional speak volumes for design? Some, like somebody maybe thought it through ahead of time. The ecosystem at Mount St. Helens works with precision, including when catastrophically disturbed. It reminds me, as I said before, of another complex system, the human body, which when injured or disturbed, immediately begins and eventually completes the process of healing. It's a somewhat similar situation. Um, second question, does the recovery of Mount St. Helens help us understand global recovery following Noah's flood? And I think of great importance here is the fact that the secular scientific community has come to believe and publish articles uh, saying that uh, observations at Mount St. Helens do apply to other disturbances, not just at other volcanoes, but at other types of disturbances uh, in general. And here's a quote from the Pacific Northwest Research Station of the Forest Service. They say the in-depth ecological research on Mount St. Helens and other volcanoes is enabling researchers to identify universal themes in ecosystem response to disturbance. This means the lessons learned here can be relevant in other disturbance settings. Is it not reasonable then to think that one of those other disturbance settings is the entire Earth in the aftermath of the global cataclysm of Noah's flood? And the last question was, do lessons learned at Mount St. Helens enable us to become better stewards of God's creation? And the Bible uh, clearly teaches that God created and thus owns the earth, but he has entrusted its management to humans. That's the dominion mandate. But what is needed for man to successfully manage wildlife, forests, lakes, streams, oceans, is not knowledge of these things required, particularly knowledge of ecosystems and how they work. And how is that knowledge acquired? It is through scientific investigation. So it appears to me, at least, that implicit in the Dominion Mandate is a requirement to do good science. And when it comes to learning about disturbance ecology of a temperate coniferous rain or forest, there's no better place on Earth than in the blast zone at Mount St. Helens. Uh, lastly, I just... Uh, listed uh, topics of relevance to forest management. I'm not going into these, just skim them over them just to let you know there's a huge number of things that would impact on forest management. Uh, the importance of biological legacies is important of disturbance. Ro salvage logging, we mentioned, P use of pesticides in the forest, uh, value of seemingly insignificant creatures, you know, like these fungi and pocket gophers and beetles and tent caterpillars and so forth. Maybe they're not so insignificant. The futility of seeding with non-native grasses uh, to prevent erosion, I, that's another story I didn't get into. But the importance of mycorrhizal and phenicoid fungi, they are incredibly important. Uh, we get a better understanding of succession, the role of nitrogen fixation, the importance of insect controls over plant populations, um, and um, the issue of invasive species and so forth. I think that does it, and uh, we'll call it uh, an end there, and uh, be glad to take any questions if you if you like. Okay, well, well thank you, uh, Keith. Uh, we will take some time to take questions, and uh, yeah, here we go. And uh, so I think of a question to ask him. And uh, while you're thinking of that, I just want to remind you the way we support this ministry is through donations. And uh, rather than passing a basket, which we normally do, we have two uh, donation boxes at the exit, which you, if you feel uh, so moved, you can help us uh, support that. And uh, that's how we support our speakers. So 
Think of a, of a question you uh, might have. Raise your hand, and I'll bring the microphone. Keep it simple. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. This is more of an observation than a question. Uh, as you were talking about the desiccating uh, ability of uh, volcanic ash, right. my mind went to uh, something called diatomaceous earth, which is sold for that very purpose, uh, among others, mm -hmm. to, as an insect control mm -hmm. uh, substance, and it does the very same thing. Yeah. It it uh, it scars the uh, the arthropods' skeletons and desiccates them, and so kills them. So it, it's very interesting how this yes. all works. Very very correct. And we used that to get rid of some carpenter ants once, and it worked. Yes, excellent. Other questions out there? Yeah. Can you speak to the, can you address the uh, appearance of fish that have come back to some of these lakes? Yeah. Um, there's been quite a bit of research done on fish. Uh, one area of great interest is Spirit Lake. and. Uh, all fish in Spirit Lake died. I mean, it was without oxygen. There's no way a fish would survive there. And then in 19, and so then they were just kind of waiting to see what was going to happen, wondering if maybe fish could come in from a side stream or such. And nothing was found until 1992 when um, some researchers caught a rainbow trout. They named it Harry. Uh, <laughs> And after finding Harry, they found others, and there's gone, it is, they have continued, and there's a good population of rainbow trout. So the question is, how did Harry and his kin arrive? And the, the best I understand, that most people believe that they were illegally, the lake was illegally stocked by somebody. And there are stories about who, but nobody knows, as far as I know, anyways. Um, again, they've also looked at the salmon runs, of course, uh, were greatly impacted, but They've been recovering uh, uh, significantly, and so uh, there's a, quite a bit of body of literature on the fish, yes. Any other questions out there? Well, while you're thinking of, uh, let me ask uh, Keith one. You know, th this is not the first volcano that we've experienced, and so why were secular scientists surprised and expecting such a long recovery because they must have seen other the results of other volcanoes. Well, most volcanoes have not been stubborn, not been studied biologically. The three volcanoes that have been studied biologically the most are Krakatoa in 1883, and that was just descriptions of things. The island of Circe that developed from a volcanic eruption off the coast of Iceland in 62, I may have the date wrong, and Mount St. Helens. And so there isn't, wasn't much effort made to study them. But m more than that also, the researchers, the biologists got off the helicopters, you know, and they, they just were overwhelmed with the appearance of destruction. Uh, it, it just looked awful. And, and so they, they, maybe it was partly an emotional response, but they tended to, as a, as a whole say, well, this is going to take forever to recover, and some things may never recover, and, and so forth and so on. But in reality, you know, if they were thinking about it, this whole landscape of the Cascade Range has been lots of volcanic eruptions, and there has been recovery. So they should realize that this place is adapted in such a way that, and designed in such a way that it will recover. And of course, that's been shown to be the case. It's not fully recovered because it takes a long time to grow the big trees, but uh, it's well along, well along, much beyond anybody's. So 40 years ago, 41 years ago, where, where did you expect such a quick recovery? Did I? Yeah. I was a, uh, a, I was in the, working in the emergency room at Providence Hospital, not thinking too much about it probably. For, for part of that time, anyways, that spring. But I, uh, I don't recall that I had a strong opinion. I was following things along. I was interested in it. Um, I probably, if I was up there, would have said this is going to be a, a real 
hard thing to recover. But, uh, you know, I think part of it is what I'm saying here, too, that it seems like our ecosystems, not just what happened at Mount St. Helens, but elsewhere, the ecosystems like forests and so forth are, are designed, they are simply made to have factors that, that will work after disturbance and bring about recovery. And I think we can see many of those at Mount St. Helens. So I don't see any, yeah, here's one. I can remember uh, several years after the eruption that um, we took a tour of Mount St. Helens with um, Steve Austin. Yes. And, um, and the focus of that particular tour was to see how rapidly that Toodle Canyon eroded and uh, the application was to the to the Grand Canyon itself, right. and I was wondering if you could speak to to the evidence as it is today mm -hmm. versus the speed with which it uh, right. So you're itself. referring to the canyon on the North Fork Toodle mm -hmm. River that has become known as the Little Grand Canyon because it is sort of a one fortieth of a scale model of the Big Grand Canyon. So it looks a little bit like it. And of course there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of teaching that the Grand Canyon itself took millions of years for the Colorado River to go through there and, and form it gradually. But what happened at Mount St. Helens of course was all these deposits were put down and for a period of time the Toodle River was just buried or it wasn't there. And that little Grand Canyon was formed uh, mainly on March 19, 1982, two, uh, two years after the big eruption, there was another smaller eruption, but a big mud flow came out of the crater and went down through that area and just carved out a canyon system in an, uh, like a day. Uh, and so we have this example of, of this little Grand Canyon, and we know that it was carved rapidly. It has a little stream going in it, and you might say, well, maybe that stream carved it, but no. We have eyewitness testimony that a big mud flow came through there and carved it rapidly. Then you can go back to Grand Canyon and say, well, maybe Grand Canyon was carved rapidly by the flow of waters back into the, ocean, into the developing oceans uh, after Noah's flood and the recession of the flood. And a massive amount of water carved the canyon rapidly and the Colorado River is just down there because it's the low point in the landscape and it's not responsible for carving it. So that, that comparison has been made, and it's a good comparison, I think. And Steve Austin is going to be out here, I think, in uh, August, potentially, and uh, it's going to be a hike, I think, uh, down into that canyon. It's an off-trail site, so it requires special dispensations from the Forest Service, but we'll see. For, for those of you who don't know, Steve Austin was the uh, scientist with ICR back then, and uh, I, I think he just finished school in his very early days early, anyway. Yes, yes. And then this was one of his major research projects. So he's published a lot of good material on that. So let, let me bring this um, part of the meeting to a, a close then, and uh, just a few concluding remarks. So again, we thank um, Keith for coming here and sharing with us. And uh, for those of you that uh, want to find out more about St. Helens and how it relates to Grand Canyon, perhaps you want to do a tour of um, uh, Mount St. Helens. You know, just go to the Creation Center. That uh, slide I showed you earlier, uh, there are copies of it in the back, and they will also be uh, up on the... Uh, um, the recorded uh, edition of this. So if you want more information, there's some on the back table. And um, also on the back table, there's the, uh, a flyer for the uh, next meeting, if we could bring that up. And that's, uh, the speaker will be Ron Payne, who is also a board member. And he's spoken here uh, a number of times before. He's gonna speak on the age of the earth. People have a question. You know, is the Earth really 4.5 or 4.8 billion years old? And what evidence do we have that the Earth really is young? So he's going to speak about some of the issues related to that, and that'll be in the uh, uh, on May, Friday, May the 21st. 
and uh, you can see a brief description of that there. And uh, the, the complete description is, is on the website, as always. Just go to the apologeticsforum.org website, click on Upcoming Apologetics Forum Events, click on the, the particular event you're interested in, and all the information is there. So, and there's, a, like I said before, there is a lot of information on the website that we like to uh, point people to and that you can share with others. So it, again, to remind you on the book tables there, we have a lot of DVDs and uh, books available. There's also, you'll see, there's a whole bunch of uh, $2 DVDs. Uh, we buy these in quantities and uh, uh, we, we, we pay $2, we sell them for $2. And if you want to take a copy, you have to promise to watch it and then share it with somebody else. Is that fair enough? So, so that's all back there. And uh, we'll have refreshments back there as well that you can uh, uh, share and uh, talk with others there. The, um, if, if you're not signed up yet to get our mailing, there is a sign-up sheet on the back table. Uh, so just add your name to that, and then you get uh, all upcoming information. Um, and again, the, the donation boxes are in the back if you want to share in the support of this. And uh, you can also support online through a donate button, if you wish, PayPal, credit cards, what have you. And uh, particularly if you want to get a uh, tax receipt, um, you'll make sure you, you could use that or... Uh, writing checks to apologetics form will also do that. So again, uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, let me just close up in a word of prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Father, we come to you just to uh, thank you for this time. We thank you for Keith and the message he has, and we just thank you that we can see all the evidence for your creation, even at uh, Mount St. Helens, Lord, where you you show us that things can happen very quickly geologically and uh, also as we see today biologically uh, things can recover very quickly because of the design of your creation and the design of earth we just thank you for that and thank you for keith's ministry please just bless him and bless his return journey and bless each one that came in jesus name we came amen